This is Openly Outspoken with Jeremy Adams, where differing opinions are not only accepted, they're encouraged. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the show. Today's guest is a a good friend of mine. We actually met, uh, for you, those of you that don't know, I've uh, been part of a, a coaching group for about five years where business owners and executives, we get together once a quarter and we spend a whole day working on ourselves. We talk about areas in our businesses we need to improve, areas in personal life uh, we need to improve. And you meet a lot of you know, really great people in these groups. And you know, I love people that are, are willing to, to invest in themselves and work on themselves. And uh, the gentleman's name is, is Bob McGinnis. He's been a, a great friend. And he's actually been a, a mentor of mine in many ways. He's a, a very successful entrepreneur. He built one of the uh, largest private dental practices uh, in Canada, uh, he's and in, in sold it. He's involved in, in multiple businesses now, still including some dentistry. Uh, we talked about a handful of different things. Uh, you know, I encourage anybody listening uh, to be open-minded going into this. We we talked a lot of uh, politics and healthcare from a Canadian's uh, perspective, a Canadian entrepreneur's perspective. So. Uh, it's really important for for us to have you know different perspectives. Like we 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 talk about how important healthcare is for this country and how everybody should should have access to healthcare. But what we don't talk about is how do we still incentivize these healthcare providers? How do we uh, still maintain a quality of healthcare uh, while we're you know, giving it to everybody for for free potentially, right? So Canada's system is a universal system. So we talk about a lot about his system in, in Canada and how we could take some of the good things from that and make a, a hopefully better system uh, in the U.S. At some point, we talk about additional political things. We we talked about a little bit of everything, and that's why I love this show and I, I love these conversations. Is we di- we didn't go in with an agenda. We went in. We we talk regularly. I'll get in long conversations with him. Uh, about all sorts of topics from business politics to self-development. This one just happened to be uh, about more of a, a healthcare and politic related stuff. And uh, I, I hope you get a lot out of it. I always enjoy our conversations and uh, hope you enjoy the show. All right, Bob, we're live. What's up? It's been a minute. How are you doing? Things are good. How are you? Doing pretty good. Uh, how's uh, How's Canada treating you? Well, I think it's it's fine. I mean, I miss the traveling and I miss, you know, I quarantined coming home from Sedona in March. And I was in my utopian environment there on my golf course and this hit. So we came home early. So they didn't quarantine me and put me in a gymnasium like my kids thought they were going to do in March. So it didn't happen. It took me 10 seconds to get across the border, went up to my my uh, lake home and just hung out for two two weeks and then back down here. But my life doesn't change too much, Jeremy. I kind of work from my basement. <laughs> so I know what were they what were the quarantine restrictions in Canada again because I know it's more strict there than it was here yeah um yes and no uh it's 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 very similar I think they follow the lead of most places in the world it was like if you if you enter into Canada they can't stop Canadian citizens from coming back and my wife's dual and I'm I'm Canadian citizen and resident so you know, we, when we came back, you have to quarantine for two weeks, can't see anybody. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, only essential people that are if you have health care issues. But the quarantine issues are, were very similar to, I think, what they had in the States. How does um, the government monitor that, a 14-day quarantine? Well, they just scare the shit out of everybody like they do with everything in Canada. You know, we're a, we're a compliant nation. <laughs> so, and people tend to comply. I don't know. That's what I was talking to Ed about a couple episodes ago. And I, Americans and compliance, they just, they don't correlate. I mean, when you think of the word American, like compliance is probably one of the last, last words that'll come to mind. Right. Yeah. You know, um, I've kind of been both worlds. My wife's U.S., but she's dual now. She's Canadian and U.S. and doesn't have to give up her U.S. passport. But living in, in Atlanta for 12 years, back and forth, as you know, I commuted. And my two sons were born in, in the States. Now they're both dual up here. But it's been 20 years since coming back home. And there's a huge difference. And I think there's a 
There's great things from both sides. If you take a grand overview of Canadian versus American, it's very similar. Everything we kind of do is similar. And I think the big difference is Canadians are just more conservative. I mean, you could say we're more tied into the mother nation, Britain or England that way. More conservative, like by American definition? Yeah, we're just, we never fought for our country, Jeremy. Yeah. I guess it's a good way to put it. So we don't really have such a strong driving interest in politics. I mean, I do. I, you know, I'm not normal up here. I mean, I'm, I'm a big outlier in Canada. From the people I talk to, I have to be very careful and put my Canadian hat on. Um, best of both worlds in some ways. Um, in a lot of ways, it's not good to be so compliant, especially with a liberal government in there, um, which that's a completely different conversation in terms of my personal thoughts on on that one side or another. But uh, we just tend to just nod our heads and say, okay, but here's the interesting thing. But if you, if you piss Canadians off, I mean, it's the end. And here's a great example. Our last, our last provincial election, which was probably, I don't know, maybe three or four years. I'm more in tune with American politics than Canadian politics. But, but we had a, a liberal government, which would be like instead of our state, it would be our province. And it existed for 12 years. So, um, and they were the majority government. So we follow the parliamentary system, which is, which is a little different, but majority rules. I mean, you know, we don't elect our prime minister like you elect your president. We don't elect our premier, which is our governor. We just, he's the, he's the leader of the party in power. So interestingly enough, I mean, they had this liberal government that was really doing a pretty good job, but then they overstepped their bounds and they were spending crazy and they were just, it pissed a lot of people off at the end. And um, the, the gal who was leading it, they literally, at that election, they ceased to be a party of power. They went from majority to no seats, pretty much. Whereas, literally, they just turned the table and said, nope, you're out. <laughs> it's like, almost just doesn't happen. It, what I think we're starting to see, though, I, I know there are... And I don't know the exact number, so I don't want to like sound like a big dummy and, and quote an exact number. But I know there is a, a large percentage of young conservatives in the U.S. I believe it's one of the largest percentage of like 25 and under conservatives um, for, for a lot of reasons. I think like cancel culture and like the audience Shapiro talks to, you know, I think Shapiro, uh, you know, guys like Shapiro are really appealing to you know, young men that are just told just because they're white, they have a bunch of privilege and, and stuff like that. And again, like I, I shared with LaShawn on uh, my last conversation, it's like, I get it. Like, I, I, I haven't had to deal with the cops the same way you have, but I still had a hundred other things and we grew up super low income. So there's that audience that I think is, um, you know, really conservative. And there's a lot of young conservatives in America, but there's also the trusting the government thing, it's so weird how much people seem to trust government because like my grandparents' lifetime was the Holocaust. You know what I mean? Like it's not yeah. that it was that long ago. And you know, the black community, how much they trust government. It, in my parents' lifetime, there was there was segregation. And and these things were like laws. This was government mandated law. And it's just like just because the government is saying something is is right like doesn't make it make it morally just and i i just think for for us to continue as a strong nation we have to be able to separate the, the two there and say okay this is a law but is it is it morally just and um you know if you look at like i would identify as conservative in a lot of ways like pro constitution you know pro first amendment right. pro second amendment like i'm you know more libertarian classical liberal in like a modern politics sense but it it's so crazy how much was gotten right in the 1700s it's like freedom of speech is is so important and, and that's being attacked right now by like the tech companies and everything like that and there's the the law i know a lot of them are hiding behind because they don't have that that liability because they're the platform they're not the person making the comment but they're the platform moderating so they they kind of are having a voice and it's a it, it's a really sticky situation and i just I don't know, man. I I get more worried that I see people have so much faith in the government. I, I think a healthy balance is good. Like, hey, government, I believe most 
government officials, especially at a high level, I believe governors uh, of states and, and Congress people, I believe most of them are doing what in their heart is the best thing. Um, not all, but I would more than half, a majority, I would say. But they're still human and they're just as dumb as make as many mistakes as you or I would. And I just think we have to realize that the government is not perfect. And in any government program, any government solution we're coming up with, there's going to be a, a ton of flaws. Yeah, I know I just went on a rant there, but... That's a good rant. No, you and I identify very similar. I mean, we're a completely different age group, but um, not that that matters. I really admire um, the way that Americans in general, and I think they take it for granted the freedoms they have that are constitutionally ingrained in you. You know, and I think that's such an enormous distinction. And I don't want to sit here and sound too critical of Canadians, and I'm not, because Canadians are great people. They tend right, to, very nice they people. tend to have. Yeah, well, nice is a bad word, though, in a lot of ways. They're comfortable, and that's, that sucks. I mean, they're too comfortable. I mean, it, you know, I get into conversations up here, especially since this whole COVID thing, and it's unbelievable across the spectrum of people that I know. We live in a small little town, uh, Niagara-on-the-Lake, original capital of Canada, great little bit of history there. Um, but we were on the other side of the border, if you remember. We fought um, against the Americans and the French with the Brits over here and the Indians and and we were just fighting just because, not because we're protecting anything, just because we were told to fight, likely, because the Brits came and controlled it. We were, we were a colony. Um, and we never really fought for anything, what I would be, say so-called Canadian. So what we don't have is that kind of sense of just like, I have certain rights. I mean, I, I, our, our ancestors fought for this. And it's interesting because that kind of, kind of goes back to the Revolutionary War, it seems to me, and I'm not as versed in American history as you are, but it, it's something that when you fight for something that's that important to have your own freedom and identity, and what came out of that was that most amazing document I think I've, I've ever been exposed to was the American Constitution. And when you go to the Smithsonian, you look at this, and you, you just see that, and there's a huge void that exists as a Canadian looking at that. It's like, why the fuck don't we have something like that? It's like, what does it mean to be Canadian? So I even even asked myself for years after, you know, spending so much time in the U.S. And um, it's it's just crazy that if you ask a Canadian what it is to be a Canadian, I go, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's nice. <laughs> yeah. It's like, well, okay, if you even ask them about government, okay, how, how are government, how does government run? We don't really know. I mean, it's just glossed over and it's a stupid history class, but it's a really... It's, it's a little bit sad when you get into situations where we are so influenced by the decisions of government that you're not aware of where you should stand in that, where you should be able to stand on, you know, the big right, the big left, and, and be really aware and informed of what decisions you make. I mean, we don't have those much in Canada. And, you know, even some of my close friends, very successful businessmen, and I you see them and, and we'll talk, and it's like, yeah, and they get it very intelligent. The minute you say anything that challenges the norm, that challenges where the government's going, it's like the conversation just, okay. There's not really that strong, healthy debate, which you're actually trying to promote in this very podcast. And I think that's what's missing up here a lot. Um, I don't want to overstep my bounds with some of my Canadian friends. But I don't really, I don't do things conventionally. I never have. Um, so... It's, it's just something that, you know, you should be very proud of your ability to have healthy debate. You should be very proud of whatever side you stand on, that you can sit there and you can actually support your opinion. And it's, that's where progress is right at that level. I mean, this, this thing right now where people are just so afraid of communicating and telling their own truth, doesn't matter what side you're on. You know, it's just, it just appears to me that it doesn't matter about the search for this balance and healthy debate that I think really everybody is, everybody is craving. So you, you identify yourself as a, as, a, as a type of conservative in your age group. But it's almost to the point like it, that becomes a defining thing, which you should be defined by, you should be proud of, whether you're a, a real st strong social liberal that's out there for social justice or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't really matter what you're identified at, as long as you know, your underlying motivation um, is is authentic and it's true 
And here's what I really don't like. I don't like the fact that if you can't respectfully communicate how you feel in terms of your own opinion, and you're shut down with this horrible cancel culture, this being identified into something, and it's, you know, I, I don't like this, this thing that's going on. And I don't like the way technology has driven people into this so-called black hole where it's very easy to make the audience, maybe it's an audience, and it is these days, comfortable with what you're saying, knowing what they want to hear, so you can drive ratings or attention or influence and ultimately money and whatever is going on. So I, I think that's, that's, that's very important. It's so subliminal, again, circling back to Canada, because here we are, and if you ask somebody anything about politically what's going on, whether you listen to the Fox News side or the CNN, MSNBC, or Joe Rogan, or, or it doesn't matter who, who are Ben Shapiro or anybody that you're talking to, right, left, doesn't matter, as long as you can make your own judgment on it. But I just think it's so easy to actually move people with what they want to hear, and that drives their audience. And that, maybe I'm wrong with that, Yeah. but uh, technology makes it so easy to be that way. And then if you're not informed, and you know they'll jump on the bullet points that make your conversation go, but this whole black hole of just saying, okay, here I'm on this side or that side. I know I, I really admire you uh, for what you're doing because you're very unusual in your age group, I believe. You're, you're informed, but you're hungry for knowledge, you're hungry for opinion, and uh, everybody's entitled to that opinion. You know? And it's hard to get the facts, Jeremy, and maybe you can shed some more light into me as where we're going to the future of finding a great source for facts. I mean, and thank you. I think it's also important for us to be able to admit that our views can change and evolve over time. like, And just people make mistakes. So well, I think I grew up rather conservative just because that was more of what like my mom and my stepdad were and i wasn't like radical conservative i was just like okay like you know i remember like george bush in office they like like george bush when i was younger and stuff like that so i was like okay that's kind of what i grew up with and as i started getting older maybe like 19 20 i started um earning a little bit more money just learning I uh, got Audible, you know, that was big for me because I wasn't, I only took a few college classes, but I started um, listening to a lot on Audible. I started shifting left politically. So I think for years I'd actually be more, uh, more Democrat. And, uh, you know, especially for things like, like healthcare, which still to this day, I, I'm a pretty like fiscal conservative, but I, I, I'm not a fan of people uh, going six figures in debt because uh, someone in their family got cancer or something like that. I mean, some sort of catastrophic coverage that doesn't ruin your life. Like, it's already bad enough if you lose that family member. Uh, and then just now you're financially ruined for life. I mean, for the average American, six figures in debt is a you know, metaphorical debt sentence for uh, uh, their oh. financial future. So I... I, I shifted left and then now the last year or two, I've been like shifting back right because it's everything that's going on. Just the, and, and I do believe most of America is center left or center right. I, I believe most of us are not that extreme, but the extreme left has a big voice right now. And you just see uh, like, of, of course, um, I, I think you and me can, can both align on equality for, for everybody and equal opportunity no matter what color your skin is, who you're dating. I mean, I, I am very much for that. But what I'm not for is defund the police. And then it's like, oh, well, we don't, we don't, we don't mean defund, we don't mean what we're saying by defund the police. It's just like, we'll, we'll call it something else, you know, just the, the cancel culture side, just like that extreme left. It's just the, a lot of uh, leftist politicians are even for in like a complete open border. And I'm just like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like, how, yeah. these things are just not, those aren't liberalism. That's not classical liberalism. That's just like radical. That's not even, that's the fact that we call it left. I mean, I don't even know what it is, but that's what's shifting me right. And that's, you know, I didn't vote for Trump in 16. I, I've never been a, a big Trump guy. I don't hate him either. I think that's important to, when people just obviously hate somebody so bad that, anything they say is just discredited because there's just such a passionate hate. Like, I feel like I can look at the things that he does okay and the things I don't like. I'm just, I've never been a big fan of, of the guy as a, a leader of a, of a nation. 
Um, but like if Trump does win this election in 2020, it's going to be because not because he's a great candidate, but because there's so many people in the center where I am that are just really fearful of that radical left. And I'm, I'm hopeful it's a really small percentage that that has a loud voice. I'm very confident in that. But you know, lately, I haven't been as confident. And it, Trump, Trump, that's Trump's uh, ticket to a second term is the the, the radical stuff that's going on and the, just the divide between the uh, the Democrat Party right now. I mean, there's just there's just a lot of stuff that for me and again, I uh, when I I'll share with people and they're like, you're just getting all your news from Fox News. And I'm like, dude, I don't even I barely watch the news like I'm, I'm just reading stuff online. And, and it, it it's just it's really scary for me. And, and that's kind of where I'm at. Well, this. We just have to find a way to find common ground with people and have conversation and just not be insulting. And, uh, well, yeah, it's really, it's really important. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm not a big Trump supporter. I'm a huge supporter of what he's done and what I believe in his heart. He's trying to do, but the guy's a complete ass. The, the guy as a person, I believe I look at him as a bully because he's brilliant at what he does. And, you know, we talk a lot, Jeremy, about unique ability and knowing what you're good at, knowing what you're not, and knowing how you can win is something that happens to people that have a unique ability, probably like Donald Trump. You can say what you want about him. I don't like what he does. I think he takes advantage of somebody's weaknesses. Like, he'll find out where your scab is. Instead of staying away, he goes the other way. He uses it as a deflection, I believe to actually get you so angry and make it about him. And it's not that he's got a big back or a big chest. I think he's got such a huge ego. He wants you to throw a punch at him. What, what do you what think? It does. What do you think real quick? And I, I get in this discussion with friends. Trump was a, how much of a billionaire that's debatable. Some people think, you yeah, know, we don't, cares. we don't know. We haven't seen his returns, but I would say he's at least a worth a billion before entering the white house. What do you think? Do you feel like his motivation to run or to be in office was truly to help because not that it's necessarily doing all the right things, but that he believed in his heart that he wanted to help. Or do you think it was to obtain more power and popularity or both? Like, why do you think he, he wanted to be president in the first place? Yeah. That's a great question. That's a question that everybody will always answer for you because he's a power hungry freak. And I think it's anything but. Everything that, listen, I can, I can maybe, I have a unique position here to have a conversation about this. It's because I'm not American. I'm about people. I'm about simple values, simple things with people. I get people. I've had my, my whole life and my unique ability, I believe, is to really carefully look at people. I don't feel that I'm really great at anything, but I have an ability since I was little. I'm 65 to actually watch people. And if I take that filter, and we can talk about that more later, about what unique abilities are and, and where you go with that. But Trump is classic. He is the type of guy who has an amazing ability to win. Now, when I say he's got an amazing ability to win, I believe what that means is he knows his strengths and he knows how to get to your weakness. He knows how to compromise. He knows where to go to get things done. And he puts you on your heels. And he'll find out what that is. Now, when he goes into the political forum to answer your question about why did he do it? Listen, this guy is is very wealthy. This guy has been very successful. I don't want to stop midstream in any of these damn conversations. Well, he's worth a billion. He's not releasing his tax returns. Who the fuck cares? Have you ever been to one of his hotels? The people that criticize him has probably never had a drink at the Trump Tower in Chicago. And how the hell did he get a building in that spot with that kind of view? And have a drink there and then go have an appetizer and stay in his hotel. Well, guess what? I don't give a shit. Who, what his name is? That could be the Pelosi Tower. I don't care. But when I go there and I spend money. It is a great I couldn't hotel wait to go in to, Chicago. I oh, agree. the one in D.C. Look what he's done right in D.C. They should be so proud of what this cat did. And I go in there and the wait staff is well trained, very diverse from all over the world. I don't know if people have been there. I mean, you walk by when you went there and I see a guy jobbing by the hotel. And he's throwing a finger at the hotel. I'm going, you got a problem, pal. <laughs> if you're so upset about a guy's name on a hotel, but guess what? You couldn't get in. They had to block the road even going to have a drink. 
people are in there experiencing what he's offering as a product or a service. So full stop on that. Likely go to any of his hotels, any of his golf courses, anything he does. That guy, or maybe not not him, because I don't think it's just him. Because his he, organization, he's a at, yeah, his organization. His organization. Yeah. He puts his name on. He doesn't put any money up, you know. But I mean, if it fails, fantastic. He just says it wasn't me. And if he wins, fantastic. I mean, he's got a way of doing that. But bottom line is, he his product that he's putting out there, be it his organization or whatever, he knows how to negotiate. He knows how to get in there and come out with a product. Now, so why do I think he would be motivated to run for president? He doesn't need the money. I don't believe. It looks, and apparently it looks to me from what I see, he loves his family. I mean, how you can argue about, you know, the divorces and the things he's done, which, he, you know, whatever. His, I don't way, really his way of showing love, too. And again, I, I'm i not like, and I just feel like, and even me on this show, I have to like, if, if you say anything positive about him, it's just like, oh, you're a big Trump fan. And it's like, I think you can, I look at anybody like, and by the way, and like, before Trump, when Fox News and just, uh, just whoever would just constantly attack Obama for crazy stuff, it made me start defending Obama more. I'm like, you can't just like look at everybody and say everything is bad about that person. There has to be some positive qualities. I actually think that'd be a great way to start a debate is if Biden and Trump sat down and before they started, each said like their three favorite qualities about the other person. That'd be interesting, <laughs> right? But I, I just uh, I just lost my train of thought. Can you Can you hear rain in the background, by the way? No. Oh, perfect. All right, this new mic's working well. Then it's uh, it just started Can't pouring uh, at mm -hmm. my apartment. I just yeah. So why why what's the what's the motivation to to run then? Like what why and well, honestly, what's the motivation? Are you this year? I mean, this has been a rough year on, on him on anybody. I'm sure. Like, what's the motivation to just stay in office? I mean, you think you just thought about thrown in the towel and just say, Mikey, Mikey oh, boy, you, you uh, take it from here. Not a chance. Not with this guy. This guy's a fighter. I mean, if you think about what he got in there and he calls it the swap and if he's, he's a, he's a successful businessman, whether you can kind of pull him apart or want by all metrics, he's successful. I mean, it, there could be a lot of things he does that you may not agree with. And it's underhand. I don't care, but he's a successful guy. He's lived a very um, elevated life in terms of his material possessions what he's done i mean what did he say when he got in there this is a step down to go into the white house he's probably right you know so it's like so he he pro he's not motivated by money did he give up his salary or whatever i mean at the ploy but i mean i think he's motivated by if you've done that well in your life materialistically and you've got your family you're at his age um he knows what he's good at as far as leading things as far as solving problems in times of chaos. I mean, he loves chaos. So he probably looked at what was going on from, you know, being a Hillary supporter to seeing what happened in the Obama administration. He goes, this is fucked up. I mean, uh, th this is fucked up about what's going on in terms of the things he believes in as far as, you know, law and security. If you look at what his platform is first, outside the guy, I mean, everybody would have to say, do you want to be safe? Do you believe in law and order? Of course. Everybody says, of course, but then they say, but this whole police thing, but we want a legal peace. He wants to secure your borders. He, want, he wants things to, um, like, his make America great again. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. It's got such a negative connotation now. But if you look to the heart of what he's trying to do, he's not, he's not off course from what everybody would want in a free democratic society. And I think he's walked the talk with it. So it becomes talking points all around it. But he's been successful doing it um, by all metrics and what you could say. Sure, they can spin it whatever way you want. But, I mean, I think the guy's motivated by reset this thing that's the swamp. And I think it's gotten so deep. And look what's happening now with the stuff that's coming out that, I mean, if you're a, if you're a Trump hater, you're probably not even aware of what seems like it's coming out with, you know, the FISA abuses and the spying. And, man, when you can start to attack a guy like Bill Barr, if you can find anything wrong with this guy in his career and you can attack that guy like they're doing, there's something wrong with you. I mean, I tell you, not American again. When I look at that guy and I listen to his answers and I listen to what he's trying to do, that guy's not a puppet of anybody. And there's another one about motivation, Jeremy. Why would a guy like Bill Barr, who's your – he has a, Trump has a way of identifying great people and he puts them in the position. And if you're not kind of swimming his way and he's the leader, he's got to be a leader, then you're out. And this Barr guy, that's a different conversation. Yeah. But I think he's motivated by what he believes is right and wrong. What, what I uh... – 
what I meant to say earlier, by the way, is just from learning about the love languages and learning, you know, working through coaches and therapists about, uh, you know, how I was raised and how different people show and receive love in different ways. You know, who knows what Trump's love languages are, but I it, have no idea. What, see that. <laughs> but what, what I was going to say is like that. He, you know, maybe he's an acts of service guy. You know, maybe that's his, his way to because he doesn't seem like he's like the super loving, like perfect father type but all of his kids seem to have pretty good heads on their shoulder they're 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 hard working they're they're respectable i mean i know they're not as popular now because they've all gotten into politics so they get shit on a lot but before uh 2016 most people would agree that trump's kids were uh rather respectable um do yeah. you like how he acts do you from like a psychological like therapist standpoint oh. do you do you feel like he just like lacked a lot of love as a as a child. Oh, I mean, where does he get I, this? From? I think I can't stand him as a person. I can't stand that man because when you're in a position that you've had success in your life with, I'm not as old as him, but I'm not that much younger. I mean, was he 75 or 76? When I see somebody who can go through life and put aside what he believes. In other words, understanding people and relationships is the most important thing anybody will ever do in your life, regardless of where you are in your life. And you're going to circle back around. You're going to go, what did I do? What legacy did I leave? And there's going to be people at the core of it. At different times of your life, of course, money always follows that. But money becomes very important, money security at some point. When I look at what Trump does in terms of him being able to get to the successful level that he has, he knows how to manipulate people. He does. So you and think it's, boy, a, lot, it's a lot of manipulation just to, to get him? Well, I don't, think, I don't think he needs to do it, Jeremy. I think he's over the top. I think a little bit of it is politics, but he went into the political spectrum. These are not business people. These are not people negotiating with their own money. These are people who have never had a damn job. Biden's never had a fucking job. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know what you do with that shit. I mean, you know, it's like, so what have you ever done to make your own money? I mean, I have more respect for somebody who starts from nothing, works their way up, has to play the rules, has to, you know, fit in, has to get along with other people, understand people, give and take. And depending on where you are in that, if you're not if you're not understanding what's important to other people around you, it's going to be very difficult unless you just got shit luck in this new technological reality that I call it. And maybe you had nepotism or shit luck or you achieved your ultimate financial wealth. Or power, and when I look at the resumes of a lot of these people, I'm not very impressed. Yeah, when I look at Barack Obama. I'm not impressed with how he got where he is. And there's a lot of stories about it. That how did this guy come from nowhere to where he was in a district, become a junior senator? Because the guy, what well, was the guy was, was screwing around with his. Uh, he was expected to win by 80 percent majority in his district, and whoever the guy was, and he got caught with his hand in the cookie jar, and Barack Obama was running against him, and this guy won, and it's like there he is, the one. Yeah. It's like, okay, that doesn't mean he couldn't be capable in his job, mind you. I don't mind Barack Obama. I just don't think he's a leader. I just think I, he plays a real good game, you know, so. Yeah, I, I think, well, what I think Barack was amazing at, a 10 out of 10, which is something that Trump is probably like a 2 out of 10, it's just the ability to, to communicate with a, a broad audience. Like, Oh, yeah, there's no question about that. I think he's a nice guy, actually. I really do. No, I, I don't I, think Trump's a nice guy. I don't. I agree. I, I would say Obama's a, a nicer guy. Like, I would much rather <laughs> I had the to Obama's... Take the two guys to have a... Oh. I'd much rather I the Obama's kind of watch my kids than uh, than Trump. Uh, yeah, no shit. And, and I would rather play golf with Obama, and I'd rather have a have dinner with him. But if I want to just pick somebody's brain, I'm not interested in picking that guy's brain. I don't think there's much in there. With all due respect, I think he follows a teleprompter. Now when he has to speak off off record, it's brutal. I mean, have you ever listened yeah. to the guy talk? Who, on Brock? Own? Oh, not not too uh, much. He, he, hey, real nah, quick too. I mean, on, on the yeah. video, do you mind getting in the center? On the oh, where am I? Yeah, there you go. It's perfect. There you go. Just oh, get comfortable again, though. You're good. You're good. Get get comfy, man. Get right. get chill. I'll just on the the split screen here. I wanted you. Wanted you. I'm going to make a lot of people upset with my conversation here, but well, how do you? I don't really. I don't. I think Trump could have had a really big opportunity to gain a lot of popularity in the recent, uh, like with the the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement, and stuff like that. I actually think that was a, a big opportunity for him to um, gain a lot of the black vote, and I I feel he really dropped the ball. Do you? 
Do you feel like he could have handled that better? No. I tell you, when you have that much wind against you, and doesn't matter what he does, anything he says is going to be turned into he's the devil. He's evil. It doesn't matter if he try. I don't see this guy being a racist, to be honest with you. I don't see it. I don't see. I mean, he, he makes a lot of missteps. He's a bully. He says things to get you going. I think he throws things out there because he knows it's going to come back at him. It deflects for what he's doing for his base. I think it's going to be, I'll make a prediction as a Canadian because I don't vote. I think it's going to be a landslide victory for Trump. Landslide. Like um, silent majority because all the polls have Biden and a really strong leader in right now. Oh. I get it. Because if you're a Republican, you're not going to answer a poll. You're going to say, click, forget it. What do you want? I don't believe you fake people. I mean, it doesn't make sense if you voted for Trump before and you don't follow CNN or Fox News or you're glued to all this stuff to feel comfortable about, okay, I, this is the way I'm thinking, so give me more of that Fox News stuff. Or CNN, give me more of the stuff that you hate Trump. Give me some of the stuff that defends Trump. I mean, these people don't really think. But there's a lot of people out there that say, okay, why did I vote for this guy? Okay, I, I wanted to be safe. Um, I, I don't want just immigrants pouring in the country. I care about the veterans. Yeah, that's true. Did he keep us safe with all the ISIS shit? Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, what else? Yeah, he seemed to make some progress with world leaders as far as putting them in their place. Sounds like, you know, America's not first in that. I think he's doing an okay job. And the stats bear it out, I think. You don't spin him too much. You're better at facts than I am. But if I was a black and I looked at unemployment, I look at the opportunity out there now since he's been going. Hey, you can argue about, I know when you're on the social justice side, you're going to kind of stop and you can be very astute at putting the putting things where they are and there could be a lot of truth in that but it's like i think the guy has done a pretty good job of what he says if you don't look at how he did it i mean oh he just destroyed all those poor republican guys in 16 he destroyed them that was nasty that was crazy looking back at it i mean what were there like 15 candidates uh, what did he say about ben carson his mother went after him with a hammer i remember or uh, it's like it's I mean, nasty what he what this does show us is, so what, what was initially appealing to me and about Trump and what I would like to see in more politicians is ones that have a business background, either business ownership or some sort of business leadership position. It doesn't necessarily have to be an owner, but maybe you're a C-level executive at a, a decent sized company. So that was initially appealing because like you mentioned, guys like uh, Biden uh, have just spent a life in politics similar to Bernie, right? And, and by the way, on Bernie, I'll say uh, there's not, there are a few things I do agree with him on, on like drug legalization and um, stuff like that. But, you know, we, yeah, don't, so do I. We, I mean... we don't align on politics a lot, but I will say I do feel Bernie is authentic. Like his message has been it's that message. Very authentic. And that's what you can say. Ber you can agree or disagree with Bernie. He's had that same message. Uh, there's clips from like the 80s with him saying like the exact same thing that he was same saying thing. on his campaign trail. But he's dangerous, but he's authentic. I mean, I liked him on Joe Rogan. I listened to that thing and it changed a lot of my opinion. It's great to see somebody who really believes in their shit, truly in their heart. You got to admire somebody like that. That's where the debate goes. But I think the guy's a socialist. I mean, he just, I mean, he, he just, everything's free. So well, I, I, I agree with you. I think that's why most, most, most presidents have been governors. Is that not true? Most, most of them have was a governor. I think Carter was. Carter a governor? I know Clinton was a governor. Bush was a governor, I think. But I, business background, because you're running a state, whether you're right or you're left, that's a tough job, man. I mean, you're running a big business if you're running a state. Can we Can we talk about the term socialism, too? Because, again, me as more libertarian, which... You know, by definition, I'm very socially, I'd say very socially liberal, very fiscally conservative, very pro-constitution, very yeah. just like let people do whatever they want uh, type thing. Uh, I don't like both parties are socialist, have socialist policies. Like that's the thing. Like that's that's why it's not like that's why I don't like identify as, as Republican is because, well, there's a couple of reasons I don't, but. Like big, huge military spending and bumping up social security, like literally social is in the name. I mean, those are good. That's government spending. Um, oh, and there, there's a lot like Republicans have a, a lot of government spending and the Democrats, they both like to spend a lot of money. So I'm, 
I'm curious, like, what is what does socialism mean to you? Well, I mean, classically speaking, it's it's always a great word. It started out as a great word, being social, and I'm not a not a history major, but I mean, it's something which is spun in such a way as if you care about the planet, you care about your fellow human, and you want to look after people that are in need and just do the great thing within your community, you're going to be a socialistic person. I mean, but the problem is what you hit on, it's, it's, there's no balance in that, that I see. I mean, you got to pay for stuff. We don't live in a world where you can just keep handing shit out. It's got to be paid for by somebody somewhere. And if you leave the ability of the government to control the spending, that's catastrophic. I mean, they just don't know how to spend money. They just don't. They never have. So when you put the spending in their hands, as opposed to somebody that would say, listen, if you were running a good, sound business, which you have and you do, I mean, you got to watch your balance sheet. I mean, you got P&Ls, you got cash flow. You can't just be making all these problems if they're not paid for. Them. It's got to come out of product and service. So when a government can just turn a, turn a crank and print more money or raise taxes or tax those that may be generating more income, arguably, I mean, it's a great thing to jump on. And and, you know, these people who identify themselves as total socialists or I'm for social justice, it's always interesting for me when you really start peeling back what they say. It always stops short of how does the money flow with this? How does the money flow with you? I mean, there's there's some great stuff there that you can peel all these conversations back. And when you really do this, I think I think it's, it comes down to personal responsibility in terms of fiscal responsibility, you can't separate the two. And somehow it's as if you feel like you're going to be on the fiscal responsibility side, so-called Republican or capitalist or whatever it is, then you're at odds with a socialist. It's so stupid. But real, I mean, real quick on American that, though, such, yeah. on that, and that's where I guess I and I what we have in today's world in america is not capitalism and capitalism gets shit on but capitalism by definition and i would say the whole COVID handling may be an exception because the government just told people to uh shut down and businesses to shut down overnight just lost revenue um you know retail businesses and restaurants and stuff just overnight just got destroyed so that's a little different but i would just say like in 2008 when there's all these bailouts like capitalism is not having government support and that's where i guess i guess like republicans and democrats like they both are for big government just in their own ways like i'm not for giant company bailouts because that's not capitalism like if the market's not supporting their existence again take COVID aside because the government just told uh companies to shut down so that's a little bit of a different case which i also don't agree with by the way but uh like what where where do we go from here? Like, is it possible to have an actual true capitalistic society, or is there just always going to be both parties having bailouts and just both parties be being for big government, just wherever uh, they think is the best use of funds? Where like the Democratic Party is like, hey, take money from the military, take money from now, let's take money from law enforcement, put it in. Put it in schools, put it in uh, youth education, put it in, in health care and stuff like that. And then like both of the, the parties are just for spending massive amounts of money, though. And that's where, again, that's why I'm I'm more libertarian. I'm, I'm for more minimal spending. And yep. I, I don't, again, kind of know where I'm going with this now. I'm just I'm just kind of voicing my frustration with with kind of where I see both parties, because I, I I think they're both socialist in ways. You know, and, yeah, and maybe socialist, socialist is racism is honestly like the new uh, socialist. Like now socialist doesn't mean anything because for years, that's just what people would call anybody on the left. And now it's just like you have a disagreement with anybody about anything uh, race related. You're you're a racist. So then that word almost doesn't mean anything. But like, do you feel that like let's let's go into like healthcare specifically, I touched on it earlier. Do you think, do you like America's system where everybody has to pay out of pocket or have uh, insurance through their employer? Well, this is a great topic, and I think I can maybe shed some light with the whole universal healthcare model, the government funded single payer. Well, Canada has that. 
And being a dentist, as a career being a dentist, I was on another side of this. But I, but I have a unique lens on this that I think can shed some light because it's a combination of both. You, ne- you, you know, you, you need to have a, a, a great medical system, healthcare system that would look after people that need basic needs looked after, which is what everybody talks about. But you also need to have choice built into it because here's where we go with this. And we had Canadians, again, are more conservative. Our professionals are more conservative. They're not that by nature, you don't tend to be driven as much by money from an early age. It would almost be like this thing that we always used as a joke. And I remember this joke from way back, you know, in the, in, in the States, and we say the States, in the States, you know, you get a Cadillac, you drive around your town or you park it in your driveway and everybody goes, right on, man. Great stuff. Must be doing well. Do that in Canada. You park a Cadillac in your driveway or if I drive my Porsche to work with my dental practice, what the fuck did you do to get that car? It's assumed that you took too much. Now, where I think I'm going with this is when you have a, a situation like that, in the 70s, and I don't I'll get my dates wrong, but when they started late 60s, early 70s, when they started this universal health care model in Canada, government run, single payer, no choice. But when they first started it, everybody was on board. And here's a good statistic that will kind of get you thinking about this thing. Because health care, like anything in life, you have to follow the fundamental relationship. In health care, you have providers, you have patients. And then you have a system around it that needs to give the providers, just like in business, you use the tools that you want and need to give the value to your customer. If it's a patient, then that would happen. And there, it would be funded through a tax base and blah, blah, blah. Now, here's, here's what happened in those days. We had a great health care. And everybody from Bernie Sanders, who's, who's lying through his teeth when he talks about the great Canadian health care system, that's bullshit. Because it's out of context again. There's parts of it that are great, but it's not good right now. It's not good. I just went through a severe heart thing. I just had a bleeding ulcer, healthy. And in the last four years, I've had more MRIs and shit done. I'm healthy. But it's like I got to experience firsthand what it's like. But thank God I have connections. Connections. What does that mean? There's no choice. You go and everybody's treated the same. Okay. Doctors can't bill outside of what the fee schedule provides for them. You you can't even pay for something different. Well, I'll pay for my own MRI, right? I can't get my MRI for six months. True. You want an MRI done? Six months. Unless you can be moved up the chain. So here's an example that I'll tell you where we started with a great model that everybody refers to. It's worse than England, by the way. They've had it for longer, the British system. Well, Ang- England is, isn't England kind of in the middle between Canada, like they yes. still have some, which is probably what would have to work in America, right? Is it still privatized it. to an extent, but it's like government, government funded. And that and they had to go that choice. way. Yeah. What, what, what happened in Canada in the early 70s when it came out, here's a great statistic. Providers, the top of the food chain, and I don't want to sound derogatory for other people in the system, dentists, nurses, radio, but the providers, the doctors, were um, they always had an option to opt out. So they could say, look, you want to come to my office? They pay me 25 bucks for maybe it was as low as that for a consult. Come on in. I'll just take the $25. But you could also say, no, I don't want to take OHIP system or uh, I'm opting out, tell the patient, and I'm going to charge $28, right? So How many doctors do you think in those days before the 70s who always had an option to opt out? How many doctors accepted, including specialists, whatever they were paid in the system? It's 98%. That's by choice. That's That's a fantastic metric to look at. Then the government said, we are going to step in now in negotiation with the Canadian Medical Association and we're going to start capping your fees. Well, holy hell hit. Well, what do you mean? I need to have the option. I run my own business, even though medical practitioners and dentists aren't good at doing that. But I mean, they like the autonomy. These are entrepreneurial people. Usually they want their own gig. And when they started to restrict their ability, nobody in the public supported them. Nobody. Of course, our news media up here has always been so ridiculously liberal. CBC is we fund them as a taxpayer, but they're they're far left of CNN and MSNBC, if you can believe it. 
and that's our news, you know, um, it's crazy. But so they really didn't get any support. The doctors, it's not a union, but the doctors association went to bat for the doctors. Says, Look, we're not saying we're going to bill, but if you turn around and take our income from 200,000 or 400,000 down to 200,000, because you need, you don't have the money, they could do it. And guess what they did? They got it through. They started to do just that. They started to claw them back. They didn't have a choice. They just, they just started to claw back to the point. You, and Canadians, here's here's the here's the overriding thing. Canadians are very accepting of stuff like this. It's okay. We can make it work. It's good. But it got to the point, Jeremy, where literally, um, and this is a personal experience. I I have. A lot of close friends in, in medicine as well. A very close friend of mine is a general surgeon, which is not an easy job ever because you can't bill outside of OHIP. Now, if you're doing cosmetics and stuff, there's some professions here, certain procedures that are not covered by our healthcare system, they can bill outside. So these guys do well because really if you want, you know, your boobs done or a nose job or dermatology or plastics, I mean, you're good. Eyes, things with eyes. But anything covered under OHIP, you have to, Except that fee. OHIP is build. the that's the the federal insurance. That's well. Oh, I'm sorry. OHIP is our state run. It's it's everybody has their own version of OHIP because it's a universal healthcare system mandated federally. But but there's a little wiggle room within the provinces. But they can't extra bill in any province. So OHIP is the Ontario Health Insurance Program. Okay, got it. And it was brutal. And so what and they started OHIP, to do. Well, here's it. They set the so OHIP sets they set the prices they control what a price is for something. Hundred percent. Doctors have no choice. Patients don't even have a choice. So we're sitting here going, well, wait a minute. I can't get. I want an MRI. Well, what if I just pay a little more and get my own? Nope, can't do it. They don't have even the ability to combine the two like they're doing in England. They don't have the ability to combine the best of both because you've got to have choice in there. You've got to have some responsibility for the consumer, the patient. You line up an emergency department here, which I went when I had a bleeding ulcer, and I didn't even want to go. And I ended up going because my doctor, who's a neighbor, you got to go. You got to go get this testing done. You got to go see where you are with this. Your, your numbers are low. You better go to emerge. So I went down there four hours later with people literally would be smoking cigarettes in the waiting room. And they don't care. It's like the fact they're waiting four to five hours. They're pissed off because they're missing their coffee and their smoke. This is the shit that's going on. And they just go there because it's just they abuse the system. I finally get seen to get something done. Two hours again later, I come up and I couldn't even. Now, I don't want to sound racist because I'm not racist at all. But if somebody's incompetent, I'm going to say you're incompetent. Right. Nothing to do with the fact that the guy couldn't even hardly speak English and he couldn't communicate. And he's my emerged doc that's getting X number of dollars to see me as well as a sea of other patients. And he gets paid X number of dollars per patient. I look at this guy, the numbers came back. I said, what do you see? He said, this number is so low. And I'm, I'm, I have to actually, first of all, I told him, look, and I have some medical knowledge. I understand how to read blood work. Why is this so low? It's 80 and it should be 145, my hemoglobin. He said, it's so low. I had to ask him three times so I could understand him. He said, medical practitioner in the system. And I said, it's 80. That doesn't sound right. I have three other results from two or three months ago that said 146, 148, which is normal, healthy, which means I have no hemoglobin in my blood. And he said, it's 80. I said, it can't be 80. I'm, he says, if this was 80, you probably wouldn't be walking. Oh, I said, so what should I do? I'm looking at this guy. And, and he said, well, he said, we can retest you. I said, how long is that going to take? I've been here six hours. I'm fucking exhausted. I want to go home. Well, I tell you what, it's up to you. And I'm saying it's up to me. Okay. All right. So what does that mean? He said, well, you can go home and you can go see your doctor tomorrow and they can, you can talk about the best way to go. I said, that's what I'm doing. See ya. He said, is that okay? Can I leave? He said, yep. So I left. So I did leave. I went home and I, and I went back the next day. It was real. It was 80. I shouldn't even be walking. And this guy let me go after me telling him what to do because <laughs> I didn't trust him. And it was like, so that is maybe just, and I had the same thing when I had my heart ablation just done. You know, it took me seven months to get in. But if you have a problem, listen, I mean, you better have connection. And I do. 
and I had connections. I had connections where my son had uh, melanoma. So I've experienced it personally. But everybody, Jeremy, when they give an opinion on an overarching major topic of healthcare, nobody has their own damn personal stories. And that's the problem. So don't listen to my personal story. But I'm going to tell you that there's got to be a choice. There's got to be a choice. Everywhere we live, we work. Everywhere that we live, we have a choice in what we can do and what we can purchase. So there's got to there's got to be a balance. Be it education, healthcare doesn't matter. This system now is done. The medical practitioners have been reduced to the point. If you have a problem, you go to see your doctor. You can talk about one thing. Believe that one thing. You know why? Because they get paid for one thing in ten minutes. <laughs> How nice is that? Well, I have another. No, you got to make another appointment. How nice is that? So there's a lot to be said for a balanced system, which is where I'll circle back and go. And I also have a dental practice in San Francisco, outside of San Francisco, as you know. And I have to provide health care for my employees. And it's expensive and it's okay, but it's not good enough because somebody should not be saddled with a $100,000 bill because they can't afford it and they do what they can to save a dying relative and you, you ruin the rest of your life. That's fucked up. I agree 100% with Bernie Sanders on that. But let the system work. And the government can't control it because they don't know how to control anything all on their own. That's your libertarian bone I'm picking again there. No, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's important to, to talk about your, your experience in Canada. So the doctors, so the, this OHIP, they, they regulate how much the doctors can earn as well, I'm assuming? Oh, and here's one other thing I'll just throw in there, what you just said. A couple of years ago, the um, the orthopedic guys, your hips, tough job. I know a lot of them. They they were clawed back. They would have they would be capped at the amount of money they could do to provide a hip. You know what they did? They turned around and they would work until September, and they would not work anymore because they're not getting any more money. They capped their income. So if you had a hip and you were scheduled in September, you already waited two years. Guess what happened? Sorry, we'll try and get you in next year. What things happening to the other hip? Now you got two hips. The very weight's going on the other hip. It's a fucking joke. It's a joke. They can't bill outside of it. You can't pay extra. You can't just say, I'll, you know, is there a way I can get a better hip joint? I'll just pay more. Can you do that? But it's because of this socialistic attitude that we have, very liberal attitude. It's all equal. I hate that word, equal. <laughs> unless mean, it's unless it's for equal opportunity, which I think we can ah, a great word. Equal opportunity, equal outcome is garbage. Yeah, equal, equal outcome, outcome is crap. I mean, that's a Jordan Peterson yeah. thing. Yeah, I mean that that's true. Yeah, thank God for Jordan. E- equal yeah. outcome oh. is a is a dangerous thing to. Uh, of course, we want that. We want high outcomes for everybody, um, and mm-hmm. we create equal opportunity for that. Which, by the way, like we we're talking about. You know everything going on in the country with with rights for for every every American um, equal. We should do our best to create equal opportunity for everybody. So if there's anything holding back opportunity, specifically a, a government policy or any type of government legislation, I am a hundred percent opposed to that. But when you you have equal opportunity, then it just comes to you know who wants it the most and who's going to work and. So the the back to the healthcare though. Um, I like the fact you're looking after your teeth, by the way, Jeremy. Good stuff. What do you mean? You got the little floss right Oh yeah, yeah. I'm actually <laughs> oh, speaking of that. Yeah, dentist, you would notice that. I'm I'm going. I uh, I'm getting a cap on Thursday. So mm. even in America, and I have I have good insurance. We just got a new really solid policy for um, for unicorn. I think caps, like I still have to pay for 70% of it. It's still going to cost me like a grand or a little bit more or something like that. So it's our insurance doesn't, uh, even good dental insurance is the best plan they had. Uh, we got a, a new company plan. Uh, I, I still have to pay a good amount out of pocket. Um, it's obviously, I'm going to get that's done, so, but it is interesting that. That's crazy dental topic about dental insurance companies. That's, that's, we won't get into that, but I mean, I'm going to change some of that. Yeah, we, 
stuff I'm doing. We've talked about that. I actually, I, I think there's yeah. some some big opportunity there in our in our conversation. There is. So back to America's system now, we both agree that somebody going in six figures in debt to their kid gets an illness, a family member gets cancer, stuff like that, to pay for treatments, I think we're both adamantly against that. So how do you take our current system with there's there's tens of millions of people unemployed right now, I mean unemployed, actually, yeah, unemployed too, unemployed and uninsured, there are, yeah. even more uninsured because of the unemployed. But what's interesting in our, our society is the the super old and the super low income have government uh, health insurance in, in America, uh, which is which seems kind of backwards too, because not for like the the super low income or the super young, right? If you're really young, you have it. If you're really low income, you have it. And then by the time you get in your sixties or whatever, uh, you get it. And then it's just like there's people waiting for years. And they just like treating their bodies like shit. And then once they get this government health care, they get this operation. Like that system even seems kind of backwards because people, they're just not incentivized to, to, to be mm-hmm. healthy or anything. Like what, what's the, the best system for us? I know, by the way, I know healthcare isn't even a, a popular political topic uh, right now. I think that's going to be interesting in the 2020 debate that, Healthcare barely comes up because just everything else is going on. But I, I still think it's probably the Huge. most important. And I, I do agree that a healthy society will lead to a healthier economy and a bunch of things. So right. what what is the like with the American system? What, what do you feel is the is the ideal solution just with your background and and the medical? Well, that's a, that's a really great question. And I think at the heart of it, because whenever you're doing something where it's there's an enormous financial commitment that we have these days to to build into this thing a certain level of basic expectation and care. And that's going up all the time with technology and cost. And anybody who's in the private sector should be well rewarded for doing something well. But you got to have the competition built in. And so here's where I think it starts this conversation. In anything in life, there has to be a certain amount of personal responsibility and accountability built in. And I think if you start there, saying that if you're having... If you expect somebody to look after your needs, your healthcare needs, I think there has to be a a certain amount of personal responsibility attached with some absolute notable exceptions where people, somebody's not capable, maybe somebody's not mentally capable. But when we look at healthcare and when we look at the, what did I, I heard a statistic once that I, I won't get right, but it was a great one. They said 90, 90% of all pathology can be directly peeled back to obesity. Disease processes usually have that at the heart, a lot of it. That's a lot. And the cost is catastrophic to look after these people. So starting with the premise, there's a certain level of responsibility and accountability, but that's not where it ends. That's just a part of it. So there has to be something built into an overall system that has that as an element. When I see people smoking, eating donuts, you know, drinking, I can't wait to get out to the bar to have another drink. And they're waiting in the waiting room with me to get my visit done. And I'm on an equal playing field with them, which it's not about me. It's just about, you don't even care about the care you're going to get. You don't even respect what you're already given because it's your right. It's not your right. What? Now, here's the next thing. Now, Go, I was going to say what I agree with having some sort of personal responsibility. What would the potential consequences be? Like, how do you... How do you enforce that? Copay. Okay. Comes down to money. There you go. Money and personal responsibility and accountability are hand to hand in anything in life. Now, here's what I would say. We need to understand that everybody who's contributing to the to the health system, be it an insurer, be it a technology provider, a researcher, or a high level practitioner, or anybody in the system deserves to be compensated is compensated well for what they do. Now, that's different. It's a marketplace-driven thing. A nurse shouldn't make as much as a doctor. But you need to have some kind of a balance in what people make in a system. Now, you can establish a certain basic level of health care, and I think that needs to be done, where you're not going to get a $100,000 bill, but you may not get this, this equality is you have an equal opportunity 
to get the best care that you can. That's going to cost you. Probably it's the way the world we live in. If you want the best car, the safest car, I think you were driving when I was with you, Jeremy. That thing was a rocket. But yeah, that car yeah, costs money. I know. But but but, um, but I think in, in terms of that, it's about choice. It's about the ability to have choice. Now, so if you give choice for those who want to pay more for it, then I think that allows the, the, the system to not spend money on people willing to pay more. Well, then you save that somehow and monitor the amount that's, that's kept within the system. So there's got to be some kind of accountability built in. So if you show up to the emergency department, for example, and you have something going on, and if it's anything that's maybe an urgent need, but if it's not an urgent need, you come there because you're not informed or you don't care, or you use this as just a place to sit and socialize for the evening. I don't know. I mean, that actually happens with some people up here. It became a complete social damn thing for four hours with all these people. It's great. They had a great time. <laughs> they don't care. They have nothing to do. They have a job, a lot of them. And I don't want to say that, but I know they didn't have a job because they don't care. They don't want a job. They're on pogey, what we call it. So there has to be something built into a system that injects money, opportunity, and a great standard level of healthcare. That's not Medicare. It's not like we have up here, which is maybe our um, social programs, our welfare up here is not good in terms of the care that's provided. It's not downloaded properly to the practitioner. When I used to use as a dentist, we aren't under the government um, medical system. A lot of people think dentists are. We're not, thank goodness. We weren't. The only thing that we had was they would come in and we have what's called a program that provides for children of single mothers. And there's a welfare program. But l listen to what they're doing to the practitioner. I'll show, tell you how we dealt with it. So if somebody came in and the procedure would be $100, I think every dentist would say, we're willing to do our part. And we're willing to look at these people. And when we have a 60% overhead, we would even do it for 60% of the fee, which would be fair. And I think anybody would say, look, you got to do your part. So if it was $70 and it cost us $70 or $60, we make very little, but we make something. We don't lose money. Some of these procedures that would be $100 would be the reasonable customary fee. We might get $20. Well, how do you do that? And the people that come in don't care. They don't care. They don't, they're not thankful. They expect a lot. So you know what we did to the, a lot of the things? We didn't accept it anymore. We said, I, I'll, we'll give our own charity. That's not giving charity. They don't even acknowledge they want it. They give you all kinds of headaches. And we're told what to do to how to do it with little fee. That's not a good government-run program. It's all money-based. OHIP, when I would do any work, and I used to do surgery in the hospital, if a procedure was covered under OHIP, which we, we hoped it wouldn't be, in 19, well, my, my last time I worked was under OHIP might have been 2015. If you had an OHIP covered thing, they were paying a 1986 fee guide. Wow. They didn't change it. They didn't change it because it was such a small piece of the overall picture. They didn't care. You're a dentist. We don't care. <laughs> so, I and we couldn't even extra bill, Jeremy. I think what you're talking about, which is really important, and we have to, in America, as we're thinking about, and I, I think in my lifetime, there will be a more of a transition to some uh, universal health care system here. I, I think it's inevitable. I don't know. I don't think a complete universal health care, like we can agree on that, but something a little yeah. bit better in place and that, that covers all of Americans, at least for something catastrophic. But what I think what we're talking about is really important because we just have to keep in mind the incentive for the medical professionals. And just when we, we talk about universal health care and free stuff we like america is definitely very expensive and a lot of people can't afford it but what we are is is we have really quality service and people sure. uh yeah. immigrate here you know legally from all over the world because it's the the best place to uh earn a good living in many cases uh performing medical procedures so because of that we attract top talent and uh so I think it's just important we keep that in mind. It's like creating that system where it is more uh, accessible to people. People aren't going six figures in debt because of a disease that's a caught problem. them off guard and was completely out of their control. But we're also doing our best to 
treat it like a, a free market opportunity and incentivizing uh, doctors and medical professionals to do their job. Because like, that's what I was going to ask too is if you're a medical professional in Canada, like what incentive do you have to do a good job? You Just, don't. If you're not billing outside of OHIP, well, I'll give you a comp direct comparison. My roommate um, through undergrad in dental school was a um, became a, a general surgeon, and this was obviously I graduated in '79, so I'm going way back. But it hasn't really changed much. General surgeons have the most difficult; they deal with very sick people. They deal with usually bowels and guts, and you know these are usually old people that are very very sick, and they're at the last stages of their life, and it's very stressful. It can be anything. It's just basically you open up and you got abdominal surgery. Anything out of that, they send to the other specialists. These poor guys are really locked into OHIP. My, I actually had an accountant in those days. I was very successful, you know, by most benchmarks as as a dentist. I had associates working for me, and I built the practice um, to a very large level. And you know, a good friend of mine, um, he came to me and he said, "I want to, I want to go to an accountant." And this was a quote from my accountant. Um, when, when this very talented doctor, uh, went to see my accountant and he was a busy surgeon, he became a core, a regional coroner. I don't know what he's doing now, but I mean, these guys are, are employees of the government. So he actually came back and my account calls and said, well, I don't know what I can do with him because he makes less than your associates that have been out of dental school for one or two years. I mean, think about that. I mean, a guy who's doing what he's doing after all that intensive training, very difficult job, cares deeply about his patients, and they all do, most, most medical practitioners. They really care. I don't know if you know, but these are amazing people. Smart, they care, and they're, they're, well, they they're aren't not well paid. paid. I guess that's their, that's their and, motivation. But what, but what do they do? I mean, there was a flood that left and went to the States, but they're Canadians. Canadians have this affinity for life in Canada. And it's part of the other thing. I wish they wouldn't be so brain dead with some of this stuff. It's like, it's not necessarily your government's looking after you. Do you get that? Well, I know, but it's a calmer way of life. I said, okay, <laughs> call it what you want. But I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just imbalanced in terms of in, in life in general. People should be rewarded for what they do. But there's a marketplace version of what that is in terms of their compensation and but you got to pay some of these people well enough in the system you got to pay your providers there's got to be responsibility for the patient you've got you've got to make the people accountable that are the that are into the drug world i mean you know pharmaceutical world and the technology world you can't be you can't be so ridiculous at what some of these technologies are charging and that the competition is taking care of a lot of that but it's just so expensive to divvy the dollars up, and then you give it to the government, who's the worst at divvying dollars up. I mean, like a really like, poorly run charity. We don't donate to charities that only give like 20% to the actual cause. I feel like that's what we're doing with the government. Yeah, I mean, at it's times, true. I mean, yeah. well, have, you, have you heard any, you're a, you're a really good stats guy, Jeremy, but have you heard anything about what is the effectiveness per dollar when it kind of goes down through the line? What I used to hear at one point, like seven cents out of every dollar is effectively used for the end purpose. Is that in government or charity or both? Government, government. I, it's probably I, I the same. Charity. It's probably the same in large charitable organizations as well. I, I would imagine, like you know, I'm involved with Goodwill. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think that's the case so much with with them. But when you think about like, uh, yeah, who who knows? Ho hopefully, it's it's better. But I, I don't know those stats but i would imagine it's uh it's not really high primarily because yeah. there's a bunch of people that it's not their money so we always spend money differently when it's not our own if i knew totally if we were right. going to dinner bob and i knew you were treating and now you said jeremy get whatever you want it's your birthday like literally whatever you want i'd probably get spend a little bit more than if i was just like going and i was treating you know on myself like it's just natural so i'd probably Dep you're, you mean you wouldn't give me what I would give you? What are you no, talking just, about? You know what? I I, I probably, <laughs> no, I, since we're friends, I you know I would probably even spend less at times. But I feel like that's not the that's not how the government works. It should, if it's not our money, we're just naturally going to be a little bit more careless with it. And you mm -hmm. combine carelessness with a bunch of government employees. Like who even knows if we need half these government employees? Like. 
we always think funding is the solution in America, which frustrates the shit out of me. Like sometimes businesses run more efficiently when they cut 10% of their staff because they're getting rid of people that are just there unnecessarily, right? Like funding isn't always the solution. It can be, but just running more efficiently and effectively uh, is oftentimes the solution as well. So yeah, I... So some sort of I love that 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 take and it even spins me back to your first podcast. That was a great one, Jeremy. With the I can't remember his name. Is it David, the Goodwill CEO? Ed, yeah. Ed, Ed, mm-hmm. yeah. And uh, but but then even then, when you talk nonprofits or you talk, it, it still falls short for me in how the organizations are run. And I would just love to maybe ask Ed, and he's really got his motivation, I believe, in the right spot. But there's still some questions where it all fell short when he was talking about his employees. And, and I'm not picking a bone with it, but with healthy debate, it said I have some prof- I have some questions for him because, you know, his motivation was to give, what, 50 to 60 percent to his employees. And this is great. And what a great goal to be taking out of the pot and to be able to provide it. But I saw some questions. And I, say, I would say this. Time. So how do you eliminate your non-performing employees? What's your definition of non-performance in your in your business. I mean, how does this affect the culture when you don't eliminate a non-performer? I mean, there's a good question, right? Yeah. Because what does that do to the ones that are really performing? <laughs> that is a good question. I mean, and that's actually something that we've been talking about on a, on a board level is especially in leadership that. positions, how do we, and uh, Ed is a new CEO of this organization. So, you know, uh, mm-hmm. the last one uh, retired after many years. So Ed's been here since just the beginning of 2020. Um but yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. And that's, that's what nonprofits, like nonprofits have to do that better than government because nonprofits still have to run a bi- as a business, right? Yeah. And governments yeah. don't. So nonprofits, if Goodwill fails, like they're not going to get a uh, billion dollar bailout from, from the oh, federal right. government. Like Goodwill still has to run like a business. So uh, I, I know that's something that's very important. And Goodwill is a nonprofit, right? So like the money, the idea is the money is used for either the calls and then part of the cause is actually employing people in the community. So I actually think paying as high wages as possible um, in an organization like Goodwill does does really align with the company mission. And I and I agree with him. I agree. Uh, uh, I just I, I, I... I agree a hundred percent. I just, I think, but here, here's what the way I look at it. It's not to trash a, 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 an organization that exists, but if I put my business hat on, I said, okay, just look at this from a business perspective. And I know that's where they go. And I know that's where your mind would be. Let's run it like a business. Just because we get an entitlement is not an excuse to relax. It's not an excuse to run the business poorly because a poorly run business does not recognize um, the value that your team brings and the value you're giving to your customers. It just doesn't do it because you have a business. But when you can start out like Goodwill, I mean, oh, my goodness. Can you imagine just change the names and the title say, okay, uh, we're not going to pay for our product or very little. It's going to be donated to us. And I think of my pipe business, my manufacturer. I said, so you're going to give me the pipe? Yeah, really? And okay, well, that's good. That's good for my cost of goods. So what do I need to do with that? And then you'd say, okay. And you don't have to pay taxes on your profit. I'd go, Wow. So am I competing against anybody? And Goodwill is competing. They're still selling a product. Um, but at the end of the day, you go, I'm going to kill it. I'm going to absolutely crush this. And how I'm going to crush it at the end of the day with the amazing amount of profit we're going to make in Goodwill is now we're going to have more to share with our customers because that should be the goal. And it might be Ed's goal as well. So I don't want to say this because I loved a lot of the stuff he said. And I love the healthy debate and and where you guys were going with that and I just, I just think it's, it's an amazing thing that I think he may have some difficulty not running a business himself. I don't believe he has. I don't know his background. I know he came from the, the West Coast. Yeah, no, he was, he, he, he is a, um, you know, we, we differ in many ways politically. We also have a lot of similarities, which I, I believe most people do if you just talk through a lot of things. But I, I think he's like a perfect fit for a Goodwill CEO, mm-hmm. uh, just Good. from, from my conversations and, I think there's a lot of like more hard nosed guys like me on the board. Like, and I, I wouldn't even consider myself like crazy hard nosed, but like, I, again, I just think it's really important. Like so much of the conversation that goes on society is one sided. It's like, like 
uh, when we when we talk about like even pro sports, for example, it's always like the players, the players, the players, like the owner. Like if you look at big uh, like baseball franchises, like I was looking at the numbers, the wealth from owning a pro sports team. First of all, a lot of them weren't making money until like maybe the '90s or 2000s, but like. Uh, and, and still in some pro sports leagues, like the smaller ones, like teams are losing their ass. Like just because you're a pro sports owner doesn't mean you're making a shit ton of money. And like that, the, the, a lot of these numbers are, are public. Like I believe that it was the Dodgers. I was looking at all the teams revenue and net income and uh, the Dodgers did something like 600 million in revenue. And again, don't quote me on these numbers, but it was like 600 million in revenue and like 30 million in net income. And it's just That's like it. wow. that. And you think, and everybody's like, oh, the players, like the players should be making more. The 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 tickets shouldn't be this expensive. The food shouldn't be this expensive. And just like all these things. And like, it's just like, look at it from the owner's point. I mean, dude, at that thin of a margin, if one thing goes really poorly, like IE, or, or actually, I guess EG is the proper one, for example, EG COVID-19, uh, I don't know what the numbers are going to look like for the owners this year. It's not going to be pretty like these. These teams build value and, and franchise value because just how the popularity of the sports leagues. But and, and I'm only sharing and ranting because I love sports, but it's just important yeah. to look at two sides of everything. When we talk about issues, it's like, sure, free health care in a nutshell sounds sounds cool. If we right. pay pay more taxes or whatever and just we don't have to worry about it. But like, let's look at the business side of it, too. Let's make sure that yeah. we're attracting talent. Let's make sure that those people are going to be incentivized and and that want to get involved in this, this industry too. Well, it's, it's always interesting as well. And I'll play devil's advocate in my own conversations with myself. Sometimes it's like, well, let's look at how some businesses rate people. I mean, they aren't worth what they get because they can. And there's a lot of businesses, especially now in this technology driven world that are not like boots in the ground. A lot of them, they're making a lot of money in a really different world. And that's fine because they're taking advantage of the situation. But I'd almost have to look at it. The old business principles haven't gone away. But when you get this much money and opportunity for companies like Amazon that doesn't even show profit, and it's just, it's just a completely different world. And then you overlay with that that those are able to maybe game the system. Maybe Trump was one of those ones who gamed the system and made a lot of money. Because what I understood is he wouldn't put any money into anything. Later on, it did, they'd pay a lot of money for his name. He'd take 25 up to 50% or more, and he would get somebody else to fund the whole thing. I mean, paying for his name. that's where his genius is in business then. I mean, because if you're a yeah. business person and you never have to put it your own cash, um, what, well, what's better than that, right? Um, oh, yeah. And, and then he says, well, I wasn't running the organization. I wasn't running. It was the organization and the owner. The, my Saudi friend who owns it, he's the one who's got deep pockets, and he ran it poorly, so I had to get out. So it wasn't me. He just didn't do the right thing. So he's got the perfect answer in business. But here, but he, he's he's probably somebody when you really looked at his career and like his tax returns, taking advantage of the loopholes that are already there. Everybody does it. Go to Marin County, the richest county in in there. And those those cats don't pay any income tax. None of them do. They even, follow loopholes. Even the they furthest do. left, I, I guarantee Bernie Sanders takes as many deductions as he he possibly can. Uh, He's supposed to. It's of just course, smart. Of, the Clintons. <laughs> The Clintons, of Clinton? course. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean they're, you know, they're deducting all these million dollar speeches. You know, they're they're oh. they're probably deducting there's, there's their, no their outfits. Hey. Yeah, but you know, and there's there's people that make money in business the wrong way. I mean, you don't have to do things like I did. I mean, I mean, I, I was a piece worker. You know, I used to get paid one filling at a time. How many fillings did I do in a day? How many? things could I do in a day that was like I had to produce this to get this. I had to actually balance my books. I had to it, the whole thing. It's, it's the perfect example as you've done and you are doing it, about balancing things out. I mean, where do you put, where do you spend your money and and what revenue do you expect to come in and you take some risks and the sports analogy is a great one. They're making five points with that kind of revenue. Well, compare that to some of these internet based giants. It's like, oh, come on. So then you look at these people. I don't know who said this, but I love this quote. They said and maybe it was in reference to Bill Gates and a lot of these, you know, I don't mean to sound like social justice warriors and virtue signals and everything, but it's like, I love this thing. Says, what, you can always tell who took too much in the first part of their life because they have this obsession with giving back so much in the second half. Because now they want to kind of, the conversation to go away about how much money they make. 
like and it's the people that support these things so with so much obsession about protecting those that don't have anything that's like wait a minute here whoa, 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 whoa. where'd you make your money i mean you're trying to th- i mean come on the celebrity thing and the virtue signaling it's like you know I- i'm okay with all this but just you know do your job get paid you know and uh you know don't mix your politics with your money <laughs> when, <laughs> that's what i would say i i do feel like americans as a whole myself included this is where i feel world travel has been beneficial for me we're blinded to what not having anything actually means as well. Like our floor in America, like the floor, the people earning the least and living in the like are would be considered doing the best in like so many areas of uh, of the world. And it's it is interesting how I'm not saying we shouldn't continue to work to raise everybody up. Of course, like I'm never gonna uh, like I'll. Like, I'm never not going to want to improve things, but it, it is interesting how quickly we turn into a, a nationalist, uh, like, society when it comes to these certain things. It's just like, all of a sudden now, we we care so much about, like, I feel like the, the, the super far left progressive message is just this, like, care for society I, we just care about the greater good of society and all this stuff and then when it comes to issues going on in america it's like let's just take care of americans for all these things like everything going on in china right now no one gives a shit about you know it's just like yeah. let, let's care about let's care about uh, america like we just we shift to a, a nationalist society really quickly yeah. when it has to do with uh like our own individual like lives and successes and, and stuff like that. Like, I mean, what, what's going on in, in China is is crazy with just uh, like the, the the concentration camps and stuff like they have. Sure. And then just what happened with Hong Kong. Uh, oh, and like then just, what happened to all the human rights warriors when uh, Hong Kong was getting hammered? And they come out and said, well, you just don't understand the Chinese culture, like LeBron James. It's like, as he makes millions of dollars filtered down through the Chinese, through Nike and all the rest of them, Comcast, all these people. So they're told to shut up and they do money. It's like, come on it's, people. I mean, if you can't, I mean, tell the truth at least a little bit. I mean, <laughs> come on. It, it's like when the whole COVID argument right now, which is like, I, I, I've been pretty much against the shutdown since day one. I've been for protecting the vulnerable and the rest of us. Like, yeah, if we get sick, we get sick. Like, let's take precautions and let's continue to work on treatments, but we can't just shut down the whole world. And that's been my whole uh, mindset on it. And a lot of people have have disagreed with me on that. I mean, we just, we're like, oh, Jeremy, that's, people are dying. You're prioritizing your life over sick grandma. And it's just like, we do that every day in society. People are texting and driving, putting other people's lives in danger. People have a few drinks for dinner and drive home, putting people's other lives in danger. We're we're buying shit from China where workers are literally committing suicide because the work conditions are so bad. We don't, we don't give a fuck about that. We're going to keep buying our cheap oh. Chinese products because we love our like, like we put people's lives in danger all the time. It's just when it's convenient for us to like virtue signal, I'm going to wear a mask because I care about people. It's like, that's, yeah, right. that's just bullshit. Like oh, another way, like millions of people worldwide die of hunger. Why doesn't everybody that cares about people so much live frugally, get rid of their nice cars, live in the cheapest apartment possible, and donate all their free income to solving world hunger? They would, if they just did that, every person that did that would literally save people's lives of hunger. But we don't because yep. we we constantly are taking care of ourselves and our families first. It's how we're wired. It's in our DNA. So they're just like this community of people that pretends like they're just these perfect humans that just care about society and anybody that disagrees with them wants people to die it's just it's so fake so fake fake. it's and just it's even it's exacerbated by this election year and everything on if you're on the left anything trump says or does you just hate his guts because he can't to be you know it's just and so they won't even look at this crisis and say Sure, everybody has missteps, but I mean, you know, how did he handle it? It was catastrophic. So what the fuck are you talking about? I mean, I step back and I look and I go, well, it looks like he was listening to scientists. And sure, he's got to make some calls because you can't leave everything in the hand of a scientist. 
you pick ones on right or left or whatever. But it was clear where this was going, and there was enough there was enough trajectory down the road that was ahead of us. And I agree 100% with you. It's, it's not a disease that kills people that are younger. Elon Musk said it better than ever, anybody. Remember he said on Rogan? Was he on Rogan when he talked about his employees in China? None of them were dying. All of his feeder companies in the supply chain in China, nothing was going on. And that's where it came from. So he says, I think they asked. He said, yeah, I know what's been going on. He said, well, how the hell do you know what's going on in China? He said, I have a payroll. Oh, <laughs> And there's uh, whatever and because Chinese like people that. are are healthier than us. I hate to say it, but that's where oh, Americans. I mean, totally right. Tons of studies have come out correlating like like obesity being one of like the number one ways to have yeah. serious symptoms of COVID. It's just like I, I mean Trump, and this is what I talked about with um, uh, with Ed. Right, I, I do think there's some things Trump could have done better early on. And sure. uh, America, look, hindsight's twenty twenty. We could have probably handled it a lot better in a lot of ways. Um, but where we're at now, the fact of the matter is right. we would have a lot less death if Americans were healthier. A lot less. Oh, death. there's no question. And, and, you know, when, when they talk about screwing around with the numbers, I mean, this is not – it's a very contagious virus. Locking it down does what? You can start playing with the numbers in Sweden against Norway, but they didn't do anything. Iceland didn't do anything, and they came out fine. It's a virus that's very contagious. It doesn't kill young people. Yeah, the average age of death is higher than the than the actuarial lifespan. Yeah, it was it about is. it's about it's, eighty, and the average life of an American seventy nine. Yeah. So, so yeah. So in other words, okay. So that's not good. Every life's important, but they're not dying of COVID. They're dying of a lot of complications with COVID on top of diabetes, and they're making them change the definition of death. So they so then you say, okay, what can we look at in the data? and the science. The science is still unknown, but fuck the science. Here's what you can look at. What actually happened? How many people died? Oh, there's this many testing is catastrophic. That doesn't mean anything because if they tested everybody, they might find it through 40% of the population. It, so what? It probably is. I mean, a few weeks ago, Florida estimated with random antibody testing, they were already through 15% of the population. So it's very possible it's at least 20%. Uh, in, then, in New York, it's probably at least a third. Uh, I want to hear stats like this, Jeremy. How many people died? How many people potentially had it? It's like such a low number. So when you're mitigating risk, which is life, it's life in business, it's life in life. Like I get in a car, um, or we're going to, like, look at the people that did not go for their chemo. 50% of people didn't go for chemo, and it's a continuum. You can't give that up. How many people died because of that? How many people died because early diagnostics in cancer did not happen? How, uh, my neighbor, who cuts my grass? She didn't die, but his 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 mother doesn't speak English. She's Italian. They put the fear of God in everybody in Canada, and they all agree. It's like Canadians. We got to protect Canadians. She would not go to the hospital. She was probably having a stroke. Her son was going nuts. He couldn't get her to go. She's a strong eighty three year old Italian. She made it through, but she wasn't going. She's dying at home in Italian. Where she kept saying, "I'm dying at home. I'm not going in there." Because she was so afraid of dying. Okay, that's a personal story. But do you know how many people were not going to the hospital? No, what was a, that, that merge? a lot. Oh, the merge doc that was in the epicenter in uh, in New Jersey. I don't know where that hospital was. That was like the epicenter when it was terrible. He said the first week was horrible. We got through. Second week, terrible. Third week was getting a little more manageable. I think I listened to him talk by the fifth week. He was saying, we normally see five, six to 800 a day. We're seeing 100 people in Emerge. Where the fuck are the other 700 people? No, I mean, uh, hospitals around the country were laying people off. I mean, they just didn't have. And then when you when you tell uh, hospitals they can't take elective surgeries, which is where they make their money, and then you give them financial incentive to report a COVID death, if you and me owned a hospital and they had symptoms, and I probably just reported as a COVID death. Why not? You know, like what they were doing. I mean, no money. <laughs> Are no money, non-COVID death, money, COVID death. I, I think uh, so. Financial uh, motivation to report COVID deaths, uh, which the CDC director even agreed, is probably stretch the truth on the the deaths a little bit because of a uh, financial incentive and the lack of the health of uh, the American population. Those two things. I mean, again, it's just it. And then now there's still like teachers don't want to open up uh, like so many teachers unions are like against schools reopening. And and it's just like we 
Americans, like it's it's bravery at like on its surface, but it's actually selfishness at its core because oh, if you're a if you're an essential worker, oh my Publix cashier, my uh, my Walmart, like anything I need that's essential for my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You still work because yeah. I need it. But I'm a teacher and uh, I want to protect myself. And like, I can't take I those same that. precautions all the fucking grocery store workers are taking. Like, get oh, out of here. And by the way, and by the way, I never want to go in because I want to sit home and still get my paycheck and my union will support That's me. That's the thing too. Yeah, teachers are, are still getting uh, well. And, the unions up here. Oh. Yeah, and rightfully, rightfully so because they uh, early on they were just doing remote learning. So I think for that period, that sure. was fine. We, we had the summer break. We know what this uh, this disease is. It's almost it like more kids die from a ton of things than COVID. Kids are almost completely non affected. Fourteen and under. Um, there was, I think there were like CDC, there were like 50 ish deaths, 14 and under countrywide of COVID 14 and under 50 deaths in a 330 million person country. Like I, I made, this is probably not something I should joke about, but it, I'm like more kids probably die in like bus accidents than that die. Oh, they do. Like Uh, it, it, like what's the reason at that point, if the teachers do what we can to protect the teachers, if they're fearful, but like where everybody else like essential workers should uh continue to do your job so you can live your life but you're a teacher so kids the future of our country can continue to not be isolated and a lot of them that are lower income or in bad households get out of their fucking house like they can't come to school because of your fear of the virus but everybody that's working to support your life should continue working like i just like it's it's not braver anymore it's just like blinded selfishness that that i'm it saying is. And you're not giving people the choice. And here's what I would even say about older, vulnerable people. My dad's 95, another personal story. He had to go and um, he had a toothache of all things. I was in Arizona. So my niece took him into a dentist that I knew. Then they wouldn't even let them see anybody up here. They shut dentistry right down. So I had a guy who would see him. So my brother is absolutely classic paranoia. He was flipping out about taking my dad anywhere. He... When he took my dad in, but this is this is in March, mind you, you know, so we still didn't know. My dad's 95, very healthy, just had his hip done, eight days in the hospital home, still golfing. So he, and here's where the personal choice goes, he's pretty healthy, but he's 95. So when it came for him to get his tooth looked at, my brother brings him in and he's paranoid. He comes to my dad's house and my dad's isolated, he picks him up. Are you going to wear a mask? Nah, I don't care. Well, dad, what are you, nuts? You got to run He said, no, he said to my brother, he said, I'm fucking not. You said this to my brother. I'm fucking 95. I've been through the war. I said, I'm okay. If I get COVID and die, who cares? I'm going to die anyway. But I'm healthy and I'll take my chances. I'm not wearing a fucking mask. I don't want to. How do you like that? But no, everybody treats him. So they bring him there. And the dentist they sent him to was a great guy. He's an older guy, retired. He was still, he has a hobby. He brought my dad up. He loved my dad. What's going on? But the odd thing is, if you were in the last stages of your life, would you not like to have the choice of seeing people? Or are you going to just be stuck inside because everybody wants to protect your life? Do you not think you should have a choice of what you want to do? That's a really good point, too. The, like, the older people I've talked to about it more align with your father. It's just like, hey, like I, who knows how long I have anyway? I just want to live my life. Like, Yeah, I said, and, I, and when I was in quarantine, I shouldn't say this, maybe I'll get arrested. I go up there. And there's a great couple beside us. They're they retired teachers of all things. And he's a big bear of a guy. And he just got back from Mexico and he's quarantining. And I yell across the lake to him, what's going on, Wayne? Good. And he says to me, when are we having that drink? He say, I said, Wayne, aren't you in quarantine? He goes, fuck that. I'll be over in about 10 minutes. So guess what we did? We had our normal drink. And I have a great time with this guy. He's got all kinds of stories. I think he's 87. He's healthy, kind of. But he said the same thing to me. I said, I just took my dad in, Wayne, because he likes my dad. He did. And I told him the same story. He goes, good for him. He says, nobody's going to tell me what I can and can't do at this point. Like, Take me to jail. But he still, his, his kids were paranoid. And all my other brothers were paranoid. And it's like, there is a point in time 
Now, that was March, and that may not have been smart, because nobody could have said, you know, you could drop dead. Everybody could be dropping dead. And we didn't know. So we, didn't point, know. I, yeah. I, we didn't I'm know. We didn't know at stupid. that time. Yeah, we didn't know. Nobody knew. Time. Yeah, you had to be smart. But as it translates down the road, I mean, I think it's time to realize there's more problems that are created by, you know, the economic downturn, locking people in. There. And this is so really isolation been a big is point. super fucking unhealthy. I mean, like, look what it, Terrible. a friend of mine that actually, he was a, cancer survivors my buddy richie uh i'm gonna have him on uh have him on the show soon he was like you know he had serious symptoms and he was in the hospital for a few days and he ended up recovering but he said it was really rough and he's like look what isolation does to people in prison like this is what we're doing to our whole society kids specifically that i mean like i i don't know i'm not a child psychologist but i imagine having a five-year-old not really able to leave their house for a few oh. months has to be really, really bad for their long-term mental health. And a disease that literally, you could say, it's basically a 0% chance of affecting yeah. that kid. That kid is locked in. Like, why are, why is everybody treated the same for a disease that uh, really only affects a, a small percentage of, of the community? Like, that, that's just, to me, like, it just, it drives me insane. You can just stay away. It comes down to that same thing. Take a bit of responsibility and accountability for your own actions. So if you want, if you're worried, stay in. But the same people that are worried, they still they still go out and they do their banking. They go to the grocery store and they shame you and they look at you. Where's your mask? I said, well, I'm not six feet from you. If you want to come in here, go ahead. But you you know the rule. I'm not jumping in front of you. I respect that. I'm not wearing a mask. Yeah. I mean, unless I have to go into a store, it's like I'll stay. I'll, listen, I'm going to respect. I'll stay six feet away from you. It is, this thing is, and and this and the science that's been suppressed is terrible, you know. And when you look at, they're saying, well, it's from aerosol, it's viral load, and it, and if you know anything, to get a virus, to get the actual infection, you have to have a certain amount of viral load, and they haven't shown you can get that really from aerosol. Sure, there's viruses that they can say are in the air and in the ducts. It's very difficult. I went through the days of AIDS, back when it changed my world in dentistry in '84, and it doesn't live on surfaces. And now they're saying this doesn't live in surfaces, that to, a, to a, an extent that the viral load can cause an infection, it's a droplet. Now, I mean, sure, they still don't know all this stuff, and we don't know. But, I mean, you're going to get – the infection's got to run through and just protect the vulnerable. If you get it, just be careful. And, and, and I think they got to just open up. I mean, there's enough data now. I agree with you 100%. Stop using this now as a political football. And they will. I mean, it's just it's not right. I mean, put it this way. Everybody hates Trump so much on the other side that they don't even care about the right thing to do for the country anymore and the science. They just turn it into, we got to make him fail. If there was a reasonable, if Clinton was in there, I like Bill Clinton. Well, I mean, I've heard, learned a lot more about him as everybody yeah, has, stuff, and it's ongoing. Some stuff's been uh, uh, coming out lately. But, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, I don't think there'd be this kind of this kind of nonsense. They would say, "Look, we got it. We got a catastrophic thing going on. Let's handle. It. Let's get behind. Everybody, get behind and put some of this stuff aside. What's the right thing to do?" You wouldn't see all this looking for something to, to like. I got you. I got you. I got you. You did this wrong. You did that. Well, there is no right and wrong when you're dealing with a chaos. You do the best you can. If somebody could look me in the eye and say, "Say Trump was trying to do something that wasn't right," is ridiculous. I mean, nobody knows. I think he brought good people in. Um, he was trying to actually, but then he still used it to grandstand with those, you know, and he does that. And so this is where he's, he's a little bit, maybe he's a pathologic narcissist. I don't know. I mean, he's he's definitely a narcissist. I mean, he's, um, and and to be clear, like, I think most leaders are narcissists. They're just on different scales. Uh, Obama was a narcissist, but just obviously not on the, the scale that, uh, someone like Trump is, but most leaders have to have that just deep down blind self-confidence to like who else would want a job like a president or a ceo of a big company with that type of oh. criticism you know and just scrutiny there's evil in every leader i think they just I, know how to manage it. i i just like i don't know another argument that that frustrates me that um i i see a lot of with why we should keep like things closed down is and by the way like i will say florida has been pretty good bars are shut down um, but what it shows you is like I was out in California, uh, they're a little more strict than Florida. Everybody's wearing like really strict masks laws and cases are still growing like crazy there because I know there has been a slight decline and today is, uh, 
What's today's date? Uh, the I don't even know my oh August fourth. Uh, the fourth, yeah. So as of the fourth, and I think it just shows you people don't give a shit. Like you, you say bars aren't open, like all these places are closed. Blah blah blah. I mean, what are people gonna do at this point? They're just going over to their friends' houses and exactly. having get-togethers. I mean, people are just at this point having to live life. And uh, if you if if you really follow the social distancing thing, which everybody agrees to, right? So even the people that are saying, I'm being so careful, one life's too many, you want to say to them, okay, other than your immediate family that you've been in your own little bubble in the last three months, have you been around anybody within six feet? Everybody's going to say, well, yeah, I mean, my neighbor came over and he was a little close. I said, well, it's done. So stop the nonsense because you're going to be exposed at some level. And ma masks aren't 100% effective either. So oh. even if like you're still putting people's life at, at risk, like I guess the attitude that I just that frustrates me is that there's just that certain person, which is a lot of people, it seems, in this country that really just it's that virtue signaling like I care about lives. And it's like what like. You just you just get behind this movement. I care about these lives, and if you don't, you're a piece of shit. You don't. You just want people to die. You're being shit. irresponsible. And I agree with basic space. Like I I will say, like when I'm going places, like now because pretty much everywhere is requiring you to wear a mask. Um, I I'll put one on when I need to go into a store because I don't have a choice. Uh, but. Even before that, like, I'm just not going to get in people's space. If there's room, I'm not going to just, like, cough on old ladies. You know, I'm just going to be respectful about it. I think most people can agree with that. And that, yeah, it's just it, it's just really frustrating. I, I do think, though, as every day passes, people just getting a little bit more and more comfortable. Like, how, no matter what the government says, because I think if it was May, we'd wait for a lot of people would wait for like government and permission like hey did uh did the news and uh did dr fauci say we can go like back to normal now i just think as every day goes by people are just getting a little bit more comfortable and they're just like i yeah. i'm willing to take this chance and i regardless of what happens with a vaccine or anything by the end of the year there's probably going to be some level of herd immunity anyway and people are just if most people by that time i think are going to be back to normal anyway and what is a government just going to arrest a bunch of people for hanging out like what like people are just gonna defy the orders at some point which is really what's already happening like again why else would cases be spreading if everywhere is super strict and there's still ten thousand new cases a day in california obviously it's because people are having gatherings and stuff like that like people are just over the shit like yeah they, you, you, they can handle anything now i mean so they already know from other countries open it right up wide that's what i say just let it go and they can handle the people that are vulnerable, keep the people that are vulnerable away. The hospitals can handle it. What is this thing about hospital capacity they're talking about? What a fudge number. Because they test every patient going in. If you're getting a, a toenail done now that you've been waiting to get, and you go and they do a COVID test. Well, you're not in there for COVID, but this is a COVID case that's in the hospital. And they talk about our hospitals are at, you know, 90% capacity. And then they you realize- They operate well, what at were that you? capacity. They all do. Every they're one of business. them. business, like, yeah. And it's like, uh, and you're doing all this testing. Well, who cares? You're just doing so much testing. And that's that, because I don't understand that. That's the two most misleading stats of 2020 COVID. Cases, which don't mean anything, uh, because most cases we're seeing are asymptomatic or mild symptoms. So like, what, is case, what does cases even mean? And then hospital capacity, which is also very misleading because when hospitals are operating, my mom was a, a unit secretary a lot of her life. So I, I would like, I would ask her, I'm just like, and I knew in my head they had to operate and I started Googling it as well and just looking more into it. She said busy times of year, like in the winter in Florida, uh, because there's more older people here and they'll just have more accidents, they'll fall or they get sick or whatever. She said sometimes they're at 90, 100% capacity, like near that and like a normal winter here because hospitals are businesses. They just don't have uh, fifty percent of their hospital sitting open, or they just they wouldn't have that building. They they operate to run an effective business. Like well, every hospital bed in Canada is used all the time. <laughs> it's like, I mean, it's like capacity. What are you talking about? Case, like, yeah, case basically. numbers and oh, like hospital capacity are the uh, like two most misleading stats. I mean, it just 
you you think like, oh wow, a hospital's almost at 100% capacity. If someone doesn't know, they operate at maybe 80% capacity on a normal night anyway. Here's that. They're just like, holy shit, there's a lot of sick COVID patients. But in all actuality, it's a decent amount of COVID patients, but it's a lot of just the hospital doing normal stuff, ER, normal testing, pregnancies, normal, tests. normal surgeries. Yeah. People getting tested more than once, too, that goes into the stats. I've heard that one, too. Uh, it's like I've been positives. tested 15 yeah. times. No, yeah, no, actual positives. But I had, if you had your test, I read an article about somebody that his mother, and he started to look at the data, and she was she was counted 15 times because she had 15 separate tests. Yeah. And everyone I, was a new case. It's like, ah, oh, come on. I mean, so... I, I mean, I think the testing is is a very politically mo- testing and tracing. That's the, that's shit. I mean, that's not just, that we can't do that better. I mean, I again, if in a perfect world we go back to February, I mean, assuming it was here in February at the earliest, which a lot of studies think it could be here months earlier, uh, which is probably very likely. Uh, like we can just predict where a virus is. Like uh, we think we know exactly when a guy here, but. Uh, February or earlier at that point, if we did a really good job of contacting and like isolation and quarantine and stuff like that, we probably could have suppressed it better. So that's probably. where like Ed, where sure. I do agree with them. It's just like, Hey, if there was some oh, yeah. serious action taken early on, we probably could have done a better job. Jump but in. where we are now where it's just, again, a fifth of the society has probably had it or a, at least a yeah. good chunk of it, 10% or higher. Like there. At this point, like, fuck it. We, we know the data. We know it's yeah. very contagious, but not very deadly. Like, protect the, the vulnerable. And, like, so people, if you're going to get sick, uh, like, I'm sorry. Like, it is what it is. But it's not worth just shutting everything down. Like, everything getting shut down. It's just crazy. I mean, like, McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts just announced that they're, they're uh, closing thousands of locations. Like, no company, not no company, a lot of companies are doing doing well. We're in e-com, we're actually doing well because of it because people have to buy shit online. Yeah. Uh, but I wouldn't trade it though. I wouldn't trade that market gain for putting uh, a fourth of the workforce out of business. Uh, right. I, so yeah, it's just, yeah. that's yeah. what's crazy. And it's just, it, it's just so much, it, it's so much selfishness more. It's like, it's, People like disguise it like they're caring for society. Maybe some really do care about society, but it's their own selfishness more than anything. It's like, hey, I don't want to get sick or maybe somebody in my family is vulnerable. And because of that, I want the whole country to be on a a fucking lockdown. Like, and I'm just like that. That is that is not right. And that's not. It's going to be good learning here, though. And if you really look back once we're out of this this political shitstorm that we're in and you look back and you go, okay, we're going to be really prepared for the next one. And the learning that we've had now, we've never had before in terms of how could we handle it, the mistakes that we made. And you just want to isolate the crap out of it, be prepared and see what happens quickly and get on top of it and sharing this stuff. And I think that's where this is going to go. Because look what even happened the last one. Was that H1N1? Was that the bird flu? They didn't even test. It was just like, whatever it just went away but now you've got such a tension on this thing and maybe that's the positive byproduct that is everything has been pulled and peeled apart to the nth degree and we're going to be able to agree at some point once we're out of the political spin which you never are but we'll be able to say well here's how we're prepared now if somebody needs a ventilator they'll get one if somebody you know here's what we need to do to isolate if we get one of these other unknown viruses which we didn't have the ability to do before because you couldn't make people do it and maybe that's the byproduct as it settles out yeah, I, I think we'll be that if there are positives out of this, because I we're both in personal development and coaching, we gotta pull the positives from this shit. You know, totally. yeah. There we're gonna be much more prepared for the future. Prepared, I think the government prepared and we can mentally be prepared, but I think what the society, especially Americans, are not gonna stand for is more bullshit lockdowns without any explanation. I, I don't think we're going to yep. fall for that again, but I think for like medical preparedness and just like how to deal with this. And if there is something serious, I think we won't, we'll be more prepared. And I also think another big positive is going to be if there's like, if there's somebody that's sick rather than just like working through it and going to work and grinding, cause you're tough, like just stay home, just relax. Yeah. I, I think most that's people true. are probably going to be more for that now. Like, Hey, Work from home, take the time off, recover, 
And because and that I think ultimately is going to help the spread of just standard standard viruses that oh, yeah. that, that spread. And there's a cost savings in that, huge cost savings in that, and and just even the whole process of maybe coming out with a vaccine, which they've been working on for 50 years with the cold, but now they did this in. At least they've made progress in this in Canada. It's just unbelievable amounts of time. And maybe they can apply a lot of that learning to the next vaccine. Because why are we sitting here at this period of time not having a vaccine for the for the a SARS virus, which is the cold, the common cold? Why don't we have one for that? Well, it's because it doesn't kill people. It does kill people that are compromised. But it's huge money to be made treating the cold. Oh, my God. Think about that. Yeah. Um <laughs> Kleenex alone. So we didn't even talk about the pharma, the pharmaceutical side of everything, Bob. I mean, that's a whole. And we'll have to have another conversation about that. So, final, we're we're, we're coming up on a, quite a bit of time here, almost almost two hours, yep. man. This has been good. So, oh final question uh, before we before we hop off, your your prediction for the election, and I'll then I'll share mine. I know you said Trump in a landslide. Is there anything Trump you think you still believe that strongly? Anything yeah, you think Trump sure. needs to do to? To guarantee that win for him? I think when he gets closer, he'll do exactly what he needs to do. He's just an opportunist. Whatever comes out of the hat at that point, be it, you know, taking the covers off of Biden, maybe literally, because Biden's going to have to debate him. If he doesn't, it'll be Biden's end. But I mean, I think he's just going to focus on really what he did. And maybe he'll lay out some of the stupid rhetoric that he's won everything. And he's set all time records. I mean, just fucking let your record stand. And I think the people, if you, here's, here's what I would say. The people who voted for him when he had no political track record, why would they not vote for him now if they voted for him based on policy? Because nobody loved him ever. I mean, you didn't love him when you voted for him. What people he did hated Hillary. Yeah, people hated Hillary, I'd say. That was a big part of it. Yeah. and But then again, if you voted for what I think the core of what people really care about you can't say the economy has been bad under Trump. That doesn't work. You can't say unemployment's been bad under Trump. You can't say that you feel less safe because of Trump in terms of immigration. I mean, he hasn't tar- he hasn't blown any bombs off other than that Moab. So, I mean, if you really sat down and just took inventory in that five minutes before you stroke the pen, I don't see many people that voted for him voting against him now. Yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of people that didn't vote for him before that look at the alternative of the progress he's now made. I mean, that's real progress. I mean, I wish he would shut up and stop showing his records because it, it, things are damn good under Trump. And sure, he manipulates the markets and whatever, but they're strong. And just watch the market, which is agnostic. Actually, here's another one. What are the, what are the betting odds in Vegas? They were uh, last time I looked. Overwhelming that Trump is the favorite because that's money talking. That's. I mean, I, I don't know what the Vegas odds are, but that's, uh, that's a good point. I... Uh... Would yeah, you, I, would you put your money on Biden, or would you put your money on Trump? I this is what I as of today, and this is August fourth, so a lot could change. I think the debates could um, change. I think Biden's obviously. I mean, I'll say Biden is probably the worst. I just turned thirty or this year. Biden's probably the worst Democratic candidate um, in my lifetime. Uh, he's just, I, you know, I don't think he's like a horrible guy. He's just a moderate Democrat, but he's obviously like losing it mentally. He's just not nothing to get anybody excited i if the election was today though i think biden would win uh, but i think a lot could change with the baits and stuff over the next few months uh but yeah I, if the election was today i would say biden would win i think he would be a four-year guy um and then i think with everything going on in the left and the craziness i think then it would flip back for eight years of uh republican and i just think republicans get like a true hopefully for me, more like libertarian is conservative, like a younger, stronger conservative, like a Dan Crenshaw type or something that I think yeah. would actually do really well and be really likable by a lot of the country. Um, mm-hmm. So that today, August 4th, that's what I think happens. Biden wins for four years. Um, it's just the same old, same old, but shit calms down a little bit. And then Republicans have the next eight with a younger, stronger candidate. Yeah, but I want you to tell me, is Trump going to win on November is it 3rd? You guys have your election? November 2nd, 3rd? When is it? Uh, well, I think November 4th, but... 4th? 
I this what you're not asking if Trump wins today. Who's, who's going to win on November fourth? If if the election was today, I just don't know. If the election was today, and just if nothing changes from today, I would say Biden would would win. Um, if nothing changes, but again, I'm I'm I know stuff can change. I know Trump could probably do well. You guarantee it's going to change. He's the most powerful man in the world. He's the independent third branch of government. He can make magic happen in the last month to make it what go his way. When was the last time <laughs> we didn't have a, when was the last time we didn't have a two term president? I, I don't know enough about well, my not often history. because the president has power to sway the economy to, with executive orders just to get shit done. He can handle the chaos. He's got they act they they treat him like he has no power, Jeremy. And you're talking about a guy who in normal even playing fields always wins. Now this is not an even playing field when you got a guy with that much power. He can manipulate the stock market overnight. And he does. I mean, his power that he has with the media, he is going to actually be throwing out those, you know, final round hooks just to wait. And he knows this is just the, the game isn't over now. This is still part of the negotiation. And, and by the way, I don't think CNN wants Trump to lose because their ratings. I don't know if you, you saw, but CNN's oh. ratings are like the highest they've been since the 80s. Like and a lot oh. of that COVID has a big part to do with it. But I think Trump, Trump and COVID combined are just like. People are watching CNN. People are watching Fox News is having great ratings, too. But just everything that's going on in our our country, it it makes for better TV, I suppose. So, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see what happens anyway. So we'll, we'll see when it comes to that point. But I wouldn't put my money on Biden. I, mean, <laughs> Hillary couldn't I didn't say I would Biden put my money him. on him, but I said if I were to choose today, Maybe in another 30 days, we can have the money question. But there's the, there's the real question. When you put your money on somebody, you already know when, when, the, when the fat lady sinks. It's that day. That's what you bet on. Yeah. Not today. Yeah, I think, I think the debates are going to do a lot. Um, I also am convinced that if we really start, like cases have been declining in major states, I think if by the end of August, things are still declining and there's a, like a real... Um, start a transition to back to some sense of normality. Football season is going to be starting. There's going to be fans in the stadiums. I mean, by no, by you know October, it's very possible that we're pretty close back to um, normal. Maybe not completely, but I think a few steps ahead of where we are now. And if that's the case, and he does well in debate and debates, I think it's very possible. I don't think Biden has him in the bag. I'm just saying, if the election was today, I think he would win. But Maybe today, yeah. I, I, I don't. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that for sure. But Trump isn't worried about what happens today. He's a, he's a, he's a prize fighter. So he, he finds ways to win, and it doesn't. It's not over till it's over in the negotiation. That's probably where he cut all his deals. We'll see. Going to cut a big deal by November fourth. I tell you. We'll keep, <laughs> we'll keep chatting, man. Uh, enjoyed you having, enjoyed having you uh, on the show. Thanks well, thanks, time. Jeremy. I guess my perspective on politics is not really as informed as probably most people you'll talk to. But no, I mean, it, it's good down. chatting to, to an outsider, so enjoy it. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Openly Outspoken with Jeremy Adams. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player so you get updated when new episodes are live. If you enjoyed this episode, the best way to support is to leave a five-star review and share the podcast with people in your life that you feel would benefit from these types of discussions. Visit OpenlyOutspoken.com for additional details on the show. Find out how to connect with Jeremy on social media and learn more information about Jeremy's personal and business life. We'll see you next time.